Okay, welcome to episode 71 of the Sumer Sports Show. I'm Eric Eager. I'm joined today by Tej Seth. Tej, fresh off of vacation. How's it going, man? Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to do this. I, you've been killing it with these, these Friday shows, but since I was gone for more than a week, I just wanted to come on and talk football, <laughs> what we like to do. So excited to do this today for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Like when you love what you do, there, there, there isn't, there isn't no such thing as work. But work is more fun, and uh, it's been, it's been obviously great having you back the last couple of days. It was, you know, there's, there's obvious, there's like a, a chasm that's there when you're gone. So we're, we're happy to have you back. We, the week this week has not been that eventful, except when we have. And we stirred this up a little bit uh, on Sumer Sports. If you go to at Sumer Sports on Twitter, um, we tweeted out our in-game coaching decision model, which is not all of coaching. It's just fourth downs, timeouts, delay against all the stuff that like I think we could all get right on the couch. And when Sean McDermott and, and Brandon Bean, I almost said Billy Bean, um, signed their contract extensions today, we tweeted out that, Sean McDermott in those in-game decisions last year, last couple of years, last year was, Mm -hmm. was bested only by Nick Sirianni, the Super Bowl uh, participant coach from the Philadelphia Eagles, one of the more analytically sound franchises in all of sports. I think some Buffalo fans, I was on Mike Schultz show, uh, one of the, you know, great radio show hosts uh, a couple hours ago, and we were talking about it. And I think Bill's fans were quite triggered by this idea that Sean McDermott was good. And it, it just baffles me because I think about this Bills team and we're talking about one of the best teams in the NFL over the last five years. Mm-hmm. And yet these, these, these um, Bills fans in many, many cases do not believe that he's any good at his job. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting, right? Like when a coach gets a extension the fans really don't have much of a reason to get riled up about it. I think when a player gets an extension that, you know, maybe the fans don't see highly, that's something that, that you can get riled up about because that is counting against your, your team's salary cap. And we know that it's, it's zero sum and, and everyone has the same salary cap. But I mean, when, when a coach and GM are, are getting extension, that's coming out of the owner's pocket. So I don't know if it necessarily matters too much from a, a fan's perspective for for that because they they as we saw with Cliff Kingsbury they can end up really getting fired at, at any time after their their extension but I I do think that McDermott is one of the the top coaches in in the NFL I mean like you mentioned with the the in game decision stuff he's he's really really good at that and then if you look at how he's performed above what the market has expected of the Bills these past couple of years, since 2018, he's added eight wins over his preseason Vegas win total, which is tied for second in the league, only behind Andy Reid and, and tied with Matt LaFleur and Pete Carroll. So I think based on just a lot of different factors, McDermott's one of the top coaches in the league. Yeah. And you even look at, I know it's hard you know, to take a step back because I'm, I'm somebody, you know, I root for the Chiefs. I really, I follow them very closely and I have some gripes with Andy Reid. I don't think Andy Reid goes for all the fourth downs he should. I don't think he kind of – he gives it his all in every single game. And yet, you take a step back and you realize, okay, Andy took this team over in 2013. They had previously been 2-14. and 14. They, had, they had not had a losing season since. They've only had one season where they went under their season win total. And that perspective is important, right? Like, there are no – I think one thing that that graph – and by the way, again – at Sumer Sports on Twitter, if you're interested at all, I, you know, I, I don't know what the intersection is going to be between people that listen to the show and don't follow us on Twitter. But if that intersection uh, is at all not empty, go ahead and listen to us. Uh, uh, subscribe, rate, review the podcast as well. The, the thing that that list, I think, gives rise to is that there's no such thing as a perfect coach, right? Like, I think that that is really the, the takeaway you can ding McDermott. I mean, honestly, I'm interested to see what happens now that Les Frazier's gone. I'm interested to see, you know, people talk about that McDermott took over play calling in that AFC divisional round. Like, I find that a little weird because that Buffalo team defensively was one of the best in all of football that year. And there's a little bit of defense doesn't matter against great offenses type of thing. But the, the panic hitting the panic button there in a high leverage situation to me is a little bit of a red flag. But he takes over in 17. They've made the playoffs every single year except for one. And that was a team that previously had not made the playoffs since 1999. Mm -hmm. 
So you look at, there's a positive benefit there. They also, you know, they have a pretty good analytics department headed by Dennis Locke. They have like a lot of things going for them that I think build up uh, a great program. And I asked, actually asked this question on Twitter, Tage, because I was interested teams that fire that are kind of on the precipice that never actually win anything. They don't fire their coaches very much, but there have been some examples. So for example, John Gruden, um, took over the Tampa Bay Bucks from Tony Dungy kind of right where the Bucks were kind of plateauing and not, you know, making the playoffs, but not winning the Super Bowl. Gruden took that team and won the Super Bowl in year one. But people forget that after that, that team was pretty bad. That Bucks team only made the playoffs two other times during the Gruden era. And they were nine and seven, 11 and five ish. Every time they were not, they were never a Super Bowl contender after they hired him to get over the hump. And, you know, that was a Tampa Bay franchise that had never once won the Super Bowl. Same thing with this Bills team. So maybe that's one example. I know Kubiak took over for John Fox and won the Super Bowl in his first year, but they won that because of defense, not really because of anything Kubiak brought to the table. It's it's really, really tough, though, um, because, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't it, – yeah, it, it's – I, it, to me, it seems like a, a very like short-sighted decision to think about moving on from McDermott. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think, you know, and, and we can see it play out with various head coaches that have had success for so long, but occasionally have down periods because of just the variance of uh, being in the NFL. You know, Pete Carroll and, and Mike Tomlin come to mind. I think that, you know, there was a, a – a minority of, of the fan base for both Seahawks and Steelers fans that at one point or another wanted their head coaches to, to be gone. They thought maybe the, the game had passed them. And we've seen bounce backs from, from both of them as well. And, and both teams, the, the Seahawks and the Steelers are going to be in, in playoff contention this year. So I think McDermott's kind of the same way where Buffalo was, was kind of built from this, this rebuilding team without a franchise quarterback when he took over to, you know, a, a perennial Super Bowl contender now. And just because of the, the recency bias of the way that the divisional round game against the Bengals ended last year, I think there's a little bit of a sour taste in people's mouths uh, from McDermott's perspective, from Josh Allen's perspective. But I do think that this is the time to buy the Bills because when you look at it like, losing Brian Dable as their offense coordinator last year, Dable got so much credit for Josh Allen's success and for where the Bills offense was, uh, you know, in going into that, that playoff game against the the Chiefs where they ended up up losing in in overtime. And then the Bills went out last year and ranked second in offensive EPA per play just behind the Chiefs and including Josh Allen playing the back half of the season with a hurt elbow. So McDermott showed that he could find Ken Dorsey to, to take over offense coordinator and to still you know retain a good offense. And I think that's really crucial in evaluating him going forward. Yeah, for sure. And, and yeah, this, you know, they've gone through now or they're going through now what the Eagles are going to go through too now with both coordinators moving on. Um, it'll be interesting to see what Sirianni can do because I think Nick Sirianni being at top of the list, the best thing he did was give agency to Jonathan Gannon and eventually Shane Steichen. That really turned the whole thing around because Sirianni was very much more of a rah-rah guy. Um, McDermott was a play caller in Carolina, gave the play caller up, seemed to be a great head coach. Now that he takes it over again, it'll be interesting to see how that how that turns around. I personally think, you know, when we think about um, – betting and and we're not you know we don't bet at sumer but we can certainly talk about the markets i think that the markets are way too overcorrecting for what happened in january when it comes to the bills and we saw it like you post on our on our on our twitter account as much as anybody but when they lost to the Bengals in the divisional round and we posted next to your super bowl and the bills were sort mm-hmm. of on par with the chiefs people gave those odds a lot of flack and it's like i don't know man if they play the Bengals. Let, let's actually re-rack weather, too. So, like, let's just say it's a week before the divisional round. Bengals are six-point dogs to Buffalo in Buffalo. How many times did Buffalo win that game? Because I feel like our intelligentsia about the NFL this offseason is implying a much higher percentage than what's reality. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I think, you know, and again, like you mentioned, like we, we don't bet, but we can use the market to really help our understanding of teams and the, the market is, is, you know, more accurate than the 99% of, uh, you know, people that you see over, over a big sample size. And when the market had that much respect for the bills throughout the whole season, we saw them favored in, in almost every single game they played. And that kind of culminated accumulated against the Bengals being the five and a half, six point favorites in that playoff game. I think that tells you a lot of how they believe the the bills are built and how good, how much respect they have for Josh Allen, Sean McDermott and, and what that defense has to provide. And I, I think that going forward, you know, with the bills being third in, in Super Bowl odds behind the chiefs and the Eagles, that makes a lot of sense right now. I, I think that, the, if you were to stack up the, the top teams in the AFC, there's a debate at two for between the Bills and the Bengals, but the, the market, you know, likes the Bengals or likes the Bills a little bit better. And I, I think I, I lean that way as well, just because of, of everything they have to provide. So, you know, I, I, I do think just the way that that playoff game went, where the, the Bills were playing with kind of a beaten down defense, they had the DeMar Hamlin situation happen, uh, you know, just a few weeks prior, I think a bunch of things kind of built up for them to, to getting, you know, leading to them blowing out, getting blown out in that playoff game. But other than that, I, I still think that they're a very good team. Yeah. The Bengals are a very good team too. And, and probably have gotten better this off season, but the bills, you know, I mean, man, you think about that whole proverb that no until and not proverb, it's just like a fact. It's like, from 1999 to 2022, Kurt Warner won the MVP and the Super Bowl, by the way, for a team that was plus 150, or sorry, 150 to one to win the Super Bowl that year. And the 1999 Rams were meant to start Trent Green. He gets injured, Kurt Warner. That's the last time before this season that the same player was the MVP of the, of the season and was also the Super uh, won a Super Bowl. That just shows you kind of the the fact that the best team doesn't win, right? You think about like, and, and I, I, you know, I don't want to blow this conversation up, but you think about all of the Super Bowls since then, like the 2000, the Ravens, like, okay, maybe they were the best team, but you know, they had to bench their quarterback halfway through that year. The 2001 Patriots, well, the 2001 Rams were the best team in the NFL. They 14 point favorites in that Super Bowl. Um, maybe O2, the Bucks were probably, but Rich Gannon was the MVP that year. You, you go and look and like, the Patriots lose the Super Bowl the years that they was they were the best team. 07, 11, uh, 17. I think you can get you can make an argument they were the best team. And then they win Super Bowls that are the other teams were the other team. Like the the Patriots won the Super Bowl in 04. The Steelers were 15 and 1 in 04. Mm -hmm. And like they and the and the the Colts win this the Colts lose at Foxborough all the years. And then the one year that everybody thought that they were weak, they had the one of the worst defense in the NFL in 06, they win the Super Bowl. So it's so funny because what I want to say, and I said this to Mike Shope on the air, and I know it's not fulfilling at all, but the goal for a team like the Bills or the Bengals or the Chiefs is not to look at, not to point at one Super Bowl and say, that's ours. The Rams did it once, and that's hardly ever going to happen. The, the goal is to point at a five-year stretch and be like, let's get – to the final four, the final eight in all those years and just let the numbers work out. And I know Buffalo is a fan base that, you know, you lose four consecutive Super Bowls, you start losing faith in the, in the law of large numbers, but it, it'll eventually work for them. I think there's a really interesting question here from beat gamer 99. Why are the Ravens so overlooked? Um, they were seven and three before Lamar got hurt, got hurt with coasting towards the AFC North title um, also a lot of their losses were weird, like the Dolphins game where they blew a 14 point lead. They also blew what, like a 17 point lead to Buffalo too at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and the, the Jaguars game where Jacksonville rallied back to, to beat them there as well. And he made, and Lamar made one of the best throws of the entire season to Deshaun Jackson mm -hmm. to sort of try to put them ahead again, but ultimately their defense let them down. Yeah. I mean, it's a good question. You, me, Parker, you know, Sean in our chats, like we're, we're always talking about the, the Browns. And I think that the Browns are a team that everybody has to worry about because I think personnel wise, there really isn't a better team in the whole league than the Cleveland Browns. Mm -hmm. If you just, if you made every position equal, um, mm -hmm. but they lack the star quarterback, of course, right now, at least ostensibly that, that the other two teams in the division, the, the Bengals and the, and the um, Ravens have. To me, I feel like there is a I, – I do agree. I think the AFC North is sneakily the best division in all of football. 
Yes, I am with you. I, I think top to bottom, even the AFC North is, is really, really good. You have the Bengals who are, are going to be Super Bowl contenders this year, as, as everyone knows. But then the, the Ravens and, and Browns are, are sneaky Super Bowl contenders. I think both of their rosters are at a really good point. And even the Steelers are, are always going to be competitive. So that, that's why I think it's a little tough to pick a specific team from the AFC North to be like a, a Super Bowl pick because that's just going to be such a brutal division. And you know that only one of them is, is really guaranteed uh, at least one home playoff game in, in the playoffs. But when you look at the Ravens, Lamar Jackson is, you know, still, I think one of the more underrated quarterbacks in the NFL, because the, the stats that we have, like even EPA per play uh, from a quarterback perspective right now, doesn't truly capture Lamar Jackson because he helps his running backs. He, you know, decreases the amount of too high looks that the Ravens are going to get on passing situations. He does so much more than the average quarterback can do for his offense. So I, I think when you start with that perspective, yeah, seven and three with Lamar, they they were top ten in, in points per game. And then the second half of the season, we really saw Mike McDonald and that defense for the Ravens come come around from playing poorly at the beginning of the season to to being really stout. And that third game against the Bengals, the one in the, the playoffs where they outplayed the, the Bengals but ended up losing uh, based on a, a 99-yard uh, fumble return touchdown was, I, I think, like a, a big inflection point for the, the Ravens' defense because they showed with simulated pressures that they have some sort of answer for the Bengals. And we know the Bengals are really smart. We know Zach Taylor and Joe Burrow and, and Jamar Chase have answers for everything that's been thrown at them so far. So I'm sure they'll have an answer for the, the simulated pressures and what the Ravens did against them in that playoff game. But we're really seeing Mike McDonald uh, try to try to you know figure it out. And, and he's doing a really good job as, as Ravens defensive coordinator. And I, I think that could be big for them going into this year. Yeah, I think McDonald is going to be one of those where – he's going to be a hot head coaching candidate next year at the, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in, in January. That's just to me a fact. The, the only, the only, the only hard part is that the Ravens, you know, they just deal with a lot of injuries. And I, and I think that, you know, that has derailed them that they, they had something you got to be careful about. Right. And this is why, you know, once we, you know, when you guys get to sumersports.com, we will have some opponent adjusted metrics for everybody so that people can kind of do this. But the Ravens down the stretch did not play a very hard schedule at all. I mean, they were uh, maybe the one difference between them starting seven and three this year and then starting eight and three and then never winning a game in 2021 was that the schedule was easy enough for them to win some games with their back and quarterback, which was helpful. Um, and that also led a little bit to some of the whole like, well, with Roquan Smith, they were this without Roquan Smith, they were that. And it's like, well, some of it was opponent strength. Mm-hmm. The offenses that they, that they faced were not very good. Although it's interesting, I was looking at some stats today. I think you were on the call with me and Steve and, and a few other. The Pittsburgh Steelers' offense was not a bottom half of the league offense in the second half last year, and the Ravens got them a couple times in the second half. So it, it's a little bit mixed, but I do agree that that McDonald was great, and I think Todd Monken. I mean, look, when Monken last had his opportunity to be a play caller, he was the offensive coordinator for that disastrous 2019 Browns team. But when he was the last play caller. Ryan Fitzpatrick led the NFL in yards for pass attempts. So we do, like, there is some evidence that they could be really good. Um, we really appreciate all of you for sh- show- showing up. We're going to, you know, it has been slow to get to people into the room. Thanks, Mark Wills. Really enjoying the content, gents. Um, perfect. So that, that's one that I wanted to talk about because, honestly, I don't get it. And, and, and this is, you know, you're so ingrained with the Lions, and I'm, you know, a fan of the, the Chiefs and also grew up in Minnesota, so I know a lot about the Vikings. And so, like, when you're not as attuned to a fan base, you sometimes, as a national person like we are, you're kind of like, wait a sec, people don't like Sean McDermott? And it's <laughs> it's the craziest thing to me because it, it just doesn't make a ton of sense. One thing that I think we're all agreeing on right now, and I'm going to jump a little bit around here, is Trey Lance. So reports are out that Trey Lance did not get any real – there weren't really any substantive trade offers for him, and that includes Minnesota. That includes some teams that could use a quarterback of the future – um, interesting inflection point here for the Niners because they moved heaven and earth to get Trey Lance. It has not worked out so far on the individual player level, but as our colleague Parker Fleming tweeted out, the team has done fine. And it's a good omen of like, if you just draft valuable positions, you just have a good coach and a good scheme. 
And when you're bad, you tank, which is what the, the one hidden part of the Niners, when they're bad, they're bad, and they pick high. Mm-hmm. Then you can overcome this stuff. Because I, I, everybody's like, well, what's wrong with the Niners? I'm like, nothing's wrong with the Niners. They, they threw numbers at the quarterback position, and they're going to probably get a guy at the position this year that plays fantastically. And much like Howie Roseman can go up to a fan in Houston and tell them to go bleep themselves over the Jalen Rager pick, the Niners – can just write off the Trey Lance pick Mm -hmm. because they're a house. And I don't get this whole, like, well, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong. If Lance is great, he'll play. If he stinks, some some other guy's going to play. And they're probably going to be good enough to win regardless of who plays the quarterback. I'm I'm totally with you. I think that for the 49ers to be uh, second favorites in the NFC right now behind the Eagles without – us knowing who their starting quarterback is going to be week one is such a testament to Kyle Shanahan, John Lynch, and that supporting cast that they have around the quarterback. There, There is no better spot for, for any quarterback to be in the NFL than the 49ers when you combine the weapons that they have and Kyle Shanahan calling the plays. And, you know, I, I, I respect this from the 49ers. If they decide that Trey Lance is, is not worth starting and they want to go with Brock Purdy or even Sam Darnold if, if Purdy's not ready for week one. That's a good understanding of, of the sunk cost, uh, you know, kind of method there because the, the Eagles did this with Carson Wentz and, and Jalen Hurts where, where they understood, all right, we saw this year of Carson Wentz being a disaster and, and we're going to move on, you know, very quickly to, to Jalen Hurts. While we've seen other GMs still want to try it with, with Carson Wentz in, in Indianapolis and, and in Washington and, and not having it work that well. And the 49ers are, are kind of doing the same thing here. They, they tried it with Trey Lance last year, and you know we didn't see much of him. We saw him in a monsoon game, and then he got injured. But based on what they think about him internally, it doesn't seem that there is you know, a ton of respect for him. So they're, they're going to move on, and they can, they, they can come back if, if it doesn't go well with, with Purdy. And I think that's like a, a good, good kind of habit to have for them. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and you're 100% right. The sun cost thing, it's like, well, what – and I've gotten a lot of this question. There are very smart people, very intelligent people who fall for the sun cost fallacy. And, mm-hmm. and a lot of them are immediately like – well, what are they going to do about Lance? And it's like, well, they're going to play the best player, right? I mean, what are we doing here? Like, and I think that a lot of people and, and a lot of teams do operate by sunk costs. They they try their best, and I get it. Be, but most of the time, sunk costs are not completely sunk. So, for example, the Broncos with Russell Wilson—that's not a completely sunk cost. If they move on from Russ, they're going to have to pay more. You know what I'm saying? Trey Lance is a completely sunk cost at this point. Like almost all the bonuses are paid out. Almost all the salaries paid out. It is literally just what they paid for him. That's keeping him there. And we see in the data, like teams will pay up for guys with high pedigree. I think that the one issue with Lance though, is a couple of things. A, he wasn't the third best player on every team's board. Mm-hmm. Maybe not even like, he just wasn't. Let this be. We saw the Jaguars board leak. They had field second. Um, we knew the Niners at least flirted with the idea of Mac Jones. Mac Jones has been okay as a pro. We we don't know that he's universally lauded as the third best player in that draft. So that's one issue. The other issue is he just simply didn't play a lot, right? He simply he simply has not like he started what three games since 19, 2019? Mm-hmm. We've all gone through this horrible pandemic, this horrible ordeal. Trey Lance has started three games since that point. So it's just I, teams love certainty, right? It's why they pay up for veterans. It's why they they trade up for, you know, they trade picks for veterans. And Lance simply doesn't give them that. Um, Beat Gamer, yeah, this is part of it too. They also traded. But those picks are gone. Those up, that, that opportunity cost, you know, the the, the cost of those uh, of getting Lance is gone. So it, it's very interesting. I – I think that we see something similar to what happened to the Niners in 2009, where they started Sean Hill over Alex Smith. Alex Smith had had injuries, was not effective. Ultimately, Sean Sean Hill gave way to Alex Smith because Alex Smith was better. You know, Sean Hill being a seventh dish round pick and and Alex Smith being the first overall pick that eventually coalesced. I think we see Purdy. I think we see Darnold. I think we also see Lance this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that experience point that you touched on is, is really interesting. I remember looking at this uh, last year when, when Lance was, you know, for sure going to be the starter week one and Trey Lance had, had 318 pass attempts in college. 
Kendall Hinton, the emergency quarterback for the Broncos a couple of years ago had 251. So they basically had the same amount of pass attempts in college. One ended up converting to a receiver and had to play one game uh, in the NFL as quarterback. And so that that's like where Trey Lance's experience comes from is there just hasn't been enough reps for him to, to really develop. And, and the, the injury was, was one of the worst things that, you know, could, could happen to his development last year, because they were going to give him the, the, the first couple of games to, to start with. And, and that's what makes it really tough is when, when Jimmy Garoppolo came back in and was putting up high efficiency as he usually did in that offense. And then Brock Purdy came in and put up about the same efficiency and, and even a little bit higher in the offense. It, it really hurt uh, Trey Lance's stock without him playing. And it's, it's to no one's fault. You know, it's just an unlucky situation for him to be in, I think. And, it, co- it does come back to what you were saying, though, where if he does get the opportunity this year, we could see what uh, a Kyle Shanahan uh, run game with a, with a mobile quarterback that we haven't seen since uh, Washington and, and Robert Griffin III. It would, so that would be pretty exciting. But I, I think the chances of Lance starting do seem lower right now than, than Purdy and, and Darnold uh, based on the reports that are coming out. Yeah, for sure. And it, it's such an interesting um... – yeah, I mean, the other part about Lance's experience is, I, I want to say back when I was working with George, is like it was like 60 pass attempts where he was trailing even. So mm-hmm. it's it's not even that like the sheer numbers, it's the play to FCS football in a dome and never trailed. Mm-hmm. And so like even like most of his passing plays were not in true passing situations either. Like they're yeah. all play actions. Have you watched North, North Dakota State play? And it's a lot of uh, and so. You're, they were really just buying this this ceiling, and that's good. And it's okay. Like they're a great football team, and they've made a lot. They've made the Super Bowl two years before they drafted him. They're looking for somebody to take them over the top. It hasn't quite worked. They're probably going to have to settle for being in that kind of just close enough to the Super Bowl until they get a great quarterback. But that's a, not a terrible place to be. I think before I read our ad for the day, good question from B K N G S. Why aren't teams developing and then trading quarterbacks for assets versus breaking the bank and re-signing them? What could the Eagles have gotten trading Hurts and trying again with even better car? So one of the reasons is that you don't have to. So I like to put this out here all the time because I think it's instructive. Back when your guy, Matt Stafford, cost $50 million guaranteed when he was drafted, back when Sam Bradford was roughly the same, um, you know, E. Peyton Manning, uh, um, the even bigger tragedy was Ryan Leaf, who's actually ended up being a great guy. But Ryan Leaf, not only did the Chargers take Ryan Leaf second, they traded like five picks for him. People don't mm-hmm. remember that part, but like, and then they got to belly up and pay him starter money at the top of the draft. The new CBA means if you fail at quarterback, the failure is super cheap. You fail with Donald, you just go back in with Zach Wilson. You fail with, um, you know, Trey Lance, and you just go back with some other guy. Back before the rookie wage scale, you did have to draft and develop quarterbacks. I think about Tony Romo because Romo was behind Bledsoe, and the Cowboys were never going to be bad enough to pick in the top 10 when he when Bledsoe was the quarterback, so they had to stash Romo because there was no other young alternative to play. Now, it's like even if you're the Niners and you're picking 12, you can move up to three – and that the, the, the trade is expensive, but the contract's not, right? So if you fail a quarterback, you know, the, the, the getting out of it's not nothing anymore. And I think that that's one of the ones. The other one is the lack of the third quarterback rule, which means that the third quarterback is almost always on the practice squad, which means he can jump around a lot. Like teams mm-hmm. are very – coaches are very pound rich, penny – or pound poor, penny rich, meaning like they'd rather activate – a third or fourth cornerback to play in special teams than to keep a third quarterback around for a rainy day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I, I do think that if you get to the third quarterback, you've, you've probably lost the game anyways. So I don't know if there's you know a necessity to, to keep that third quarterback there. But I think like the, the question that's posed here with the Eagles specifically is interesting, right? Because I think that like you you keep – I think it's easy for these, these teams to get – new quarterbacks um, if you don't have that good of a roster because you really just trot out any quarterback for, for a year. Uh, you know, like if, if Kyler Murray were to sit out most of the year for the Cardinals and, and they send out one of their backup quarterbacks this year, 
they end up with a top five pick and, and they are, are pretty certain that, that they're going to be there. But like, if you're someone like the Eagles where you have a good roster, even if you trot out a, a pretty poor quarterback, you're not going to get into that top 10 pick range most likely, which makes it very tough to, to get that type of, you know, quarterback on a rookie deal that, that you want that has a high chance of succeeding. And we know when you get outside of the top 10, it, it becomes much tougher to find the franchise quarterback. Yeah, v, VKNGS. I think probably having PTSD from the Cousins contract, but why would you give a quarterback a second contract? I, I mean, that's a good question. I, I still think the most pressing problem in sports analytics, one that we're trying to solve, is not who's going to be good coming out of college. To me, it's who's good on a four-year window of being on a rookie deal versus who's good once you pay him and not anybody else. We know Mahomes passes that test. We know Brady passes that test or did. We know um, we know that, uh, you know, Allen, Herbert, those guys were pretty much – but even then it's still hard for them. The ones that are tough are very much the Cousins, the Cars, the Garoppolo's, those team, those guys where I'm pretty sure if you pay them $40 million plus, they're not going to win. Daniel Jones, uh, not to, you know, the, our founder, Jack Jones – uh, not not very – they're no, no relation, but not very happy probably at that statement. <laughs> Here's a good question. Before I get to Amy's question, though, I do want to talk – we are a couple days out from Father's Day. By the way, Tasha, I'm one of those, and I know this is, like, because of my, like, Protestant roots and my, um, my just, like, I don't know. My mom was such a – you know, so thrifty. But, like, my, my ask for Father's Day every year is just – don't buy me anything. That is always mine. However, if you have a father or a husband or a spouse or a partner or however we want, we're all encompassing here. And that person needs to take care of themselves. And you forgot to give them a Father's Day gift. Manscaped.com. Promo code SUMER will get you 20% off. They get the Weed Whacker. Uh, and that's for the nose, the the uh, the ears, all the stuff that's hard, and all the stuff that you forget about because Tej, you don't look at your own nose uh, <laughs> other than uh, through Streamyard, like we're looking at now. Um, but not that close. I mean, like if I went up like this, people would be a little bit weirded out <laughs> by me. Um, and and then they also have the the lawnmower 4.0, fourth generation uh, t- tool for your family jewels or your partner's family jewels, which I think technically are still your family jewels. I don't know how this works. Not a legal expert. We got to get, we got to get Brad back on the show. Spielberg, <laughs> one of my former colleagues, brilliant guy. But in, in any event, there are plenty of men out there who probably need a manscape and manscape.com promo code Sumer will get you 20% off the whole catalog. So go ahead and, and support the show. The easiest way to support the show is through our advertisers. We're going to have another advertiser once we get to the July 1st week. Really excited about that because really it's a, it's another brand, much like Manscaped, that I'm all for. Amy, one yeah. of the free, uh, Amy, one of the frequent listeners to the show, Amy Bright. What's up, fellas? Would you bet the Broncos win total over? We wouldn't because we're not allowed to bet at Sumer yet. We we have to. There's some legal things we got to do to make sure that we can. However, I would if I if I could bet, I would bet them to go to the playoffs at two to one. I bet them over. And it's, to me, all about how much Sean Payton's worth and how little stock I'm going to put in one bad season of Russell Wilson among many good to great seasons. And I think if you put it together, take care of his health a little bit better, protect him more, do all the things that will make Sean Payton look like a genius, I think that they can win, um, even if in a tough AFC. What do you think, Tej? Yes, no, I'm I'm, I'm with you. I think think – you know, it's, it's, it's good to be optimistic about the Broncos this year. And I think, it, you know, you can draw a parallel between Russell Wilson's career and, and Aaron Rodgers' career, right? So Aaron Rodgers from, you know, 2008 to 2014 was, was one of the best quarterbacks in the league, couple MVPs, got the Super Bowl in there. But then we saw something really interesting happen in 2018 and 2019, where he just became outside of the top 10 in, in EPA per play both of those seasons. And, and it started to look like he was declining. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people were, were pointing this out, pointing out that his efficiency has gone down. But they hire, they hire Matt LaFleur in, in, in 2019, and it takes a year to gel. 
And 2020, Aaron Rodgers goes out, ranks second in EPA per play, wins MVP of the league. And then we see that again in, in 2021, same exact story, ranks first in EPA per play, wins MVP. And I'm not saying Russell Wilson is, is going to win MVP this year or, or even rank top five in EPA per play. But when you look at someone's whole career and you're using some type of updating system, the prior stays for a long time. And, and our prior with Russell Wilson is that he was a top five quarterback for so many seasons in a row. And we saw some decline at the end of, of 2021 when they ran into the, the Rams number one defense uh, three times in a row and or three times in the last nine games. And then we, we saw some pretty good play from him, uh, you know, in, in the, the year after that. And then, then the Broncos season happened. But I, I think that because with Sean Payton there and, and with the receivers that the Broncos have that you do, you will see a boost in their, their offensive production this year. Yeah. I mean, I hate to, I always trot this out and, it's funny because last year when people were talking about Wilson and you looked at like time to throw, you looked at throwaways were actually not a problem for Wilson, but mostly it was discipline in the pocket, hitting the back foot, getting things off. Rogers in 19 did not buy into the offense, right? At all. Like there was still a ton of throwaways. There was still a lot, a long time to throw. It was year two, as you said, in that Lafleur. Um, and, and, and Hackett system where he did really well. And, you know, that was always like my bear case on the Broncos last year, which was to say it might be beneficial to get Hackett in there. But remember, Aaron Rodgers, one of the best quarterbacks to ever play in the league, took longer than just one year to mm-hmm. have some success in that offense. The, the thing that I like about Peyton, a couple of things. So firstly, Peyton and Drew Brees joined New Orleans the same year. Drew Brees had come off a shoulder injury that basically ended his career in San Diego, the final week of 2005 season. And and that basically ushered in the Phillip Rivers era. So there were injury, injury problems. There were also height problems with, with, with uh, um, Drew Brees. Wilson has similar ones. And then you just look at Peyton just, and I know that he hasn't gone over the win total every year, the same way that guys like McDermott Reed do, but he's constantly, constantly getting more out of that team than the than the fundamentals would suggest. I mean, we're just two years ago, Jameis, Trevor Simeon, Taysom Hill, and and Ian Book. That was a nine and eighteen. That team <laughs> makes the playoffs if the Niners don't come back from 17 down on the Rams in week 18. That team's mm-hmm. the one in the playoffs in 2021. So I just and then you add to the defense, I know they lost to Giro Evero, which I think it'll be another one of those defensive coordinators we talk about as a head coach next year. But that's a very, very I, it's a tough one because I think if they're in the NFC, it's a great case because every team's kind of mediocre there except for a handful. AFC, it's tough because you got to go through the Chiefs. But you look at that division, and I think the Chargers could always fall off. The Raiders, I think, are going to be pretty bad. So you have some opening there alongside Kansas City to go ahead and win that, you know, to win enough games to, to, to make it there. Broncos have not beaten the Chiefs since week two of 2015, which is which was my second week in the entire football industry. That's a long <laughs> been. I remember that game like it was yesterday. So they'll at least have to get over that hump at some point. That doesn't mean they need to beat them this year to make the playoffs. But I do think the future is brighter for the Broncos than it has been. Um, so so that's so that's uh, you know something to think about there. Um, let's finish this with a discussion of the gambling because I know you and I, so just to, to be you know upfront with everybody, we at Sumer, because we have access to some team IP, we have the same gambling restrictions as the T as, as members of teams do, meaning we can't bet on any sports. Um, and that is because, and I want to, I want to lay this out here. The reason that team employees can't bet on sports is because they have access to data on, on, on athletes that can span multiple sports. So in theory, for example, if you were, let's say, you know, um, if you wanted to bet on a minor league baseball game, you would have access to some minor league data because some of those players could have been drafted by your NFL team. And, and I know that that is harsh and I know that that is broad, but that's essentially why they're doing it. Now there, there's some funny things in the gambling policy, like you can bet on horses, you know, in, in a casino and stuff like that. All of that is is like a little bit, you know, it shows kind of how kind of weird this is and how they 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 basically made the gambling policy so that 
they could bet on things they still want to bet on, which is horses and stuff. But make no mistake, the reason that team employees can't bet on, on any sports is pretty obvious because of the access to the data. NFL players cannot bet on NFL games at all. And I don't believe they can bet on NCAA football games either. They can bet on other sports, but not in the facility. So they can bet on baseball as long as they're at home. They can bet, they can, they can't go into a casino. That's a that that's another part. They can't go into a sports book. That's illegal. So like there's all this, but the, but they've been doing this forever, Tej. It's just that now, instead of logging into smoothbets.ag or whatever and getting getting you know the best of it on a, on a game, whether it be a football game or another sport, they're logging into DraftKings, which is a legal entity that is able to catch them betting with geolocation and all that kind of stuff. I do not believe that gambling is any more of a problem now than it has ever been in the NFL. I just think we have the mechanism to catch them now. And so when people talk about this betting thing as if the proliferation of sports betting is the reason that we're having this issue, I bristle a little bit. I think it's more about that we have access to the information on these players' behavior and we're acting on it now per the rules that have always been there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it it really starts with the teams. Like the the teams are the ones that should be – uh, making sure that their players know all the rules because it it gets really complicated. Like you mentioned, like with the the horse betting exception, the players can play fantasy football as long as the prize pool isn't greater than two hundred fifty dollars is another exception. So it gets really in the weeds when you're a player and you have all these things going on, and you also have to think about the betting policy. But I know some you know team mem- staffers that have told me before that they can't even log into any betting websites on their, when they're in the facility. When the, because if, if they wanted to use like market ratings for, for one of their models, they wouldn't be able to get it from a DraftKings, from a FanDuel in their facility. And that's the way that these teams should be going about it is just making sure that no one can get onto their websites in the facility. And it, it, it goes back to the, the Jameson Williams uh, and, and Lions betting story, right? So the, the two kind of conflicting reports about it was Jameson Williams was in a team facility when he bet on a sport that that wasn't the or, or a league that wasn't the NFL. Uh, there's there's one report that said it was at a team hotel uh, during an away game, which is is classified as a team facility, and then another one that says it was it was in the Lions facility itself in in Allen Park. So you know the the, the latter is is you know a bad look. Like you should know better, and you shouldn't even be able to get on to gambling websites or gambling apps when you're in. The, the Lions actual facility but if it's the former I think that's where it gets a little hazy with the rules because it's hard to know for a player to, to know exactly what classifies as a team facility when you're not actually in like the the facility that you're used to I think you know I think you're 100% right and, and you you are right like the first the second NFL team I ever visited as a member of PFF was Detroit and I was in their facility and it was funny because I literally just went to one of these sports betting sites to try to look up what their the future was for one of these teams. I can't remember how it came up with conversation and it was blocked. Like you're hundred percent right. Mm-hmm. It's pretty explicit. Like you, you can't be doing this stuff in the team facility, which is great. And I do know that's something the teams struggle with. Like I know that a lot of teams try to use betting market information. Now the funny thing is, and again, when I was at PFF, the information only went formally one way. We gave data to the teams or sold data to the teams. So the betting policy was a little different because we weren't getting information formally back from them. Um, but the, but like the teams would re- call me and request, Hey, can we get betting market data for the draft? And I'm like, well, why can't you just get it yourself? And they're like, well, we can't like, it's firewalled here. And, mm-hmm. and so it's hundred percent. Like I think it's explicit when they're in the team facility on the road, that's where the education needs to be there. I do think that, I don't have a problem with the way that the, the policy is, especially for team member, you know, team employees as well as players. I just think maybe we have to educate them better. And I also don't have a problem, by the way, with this idea that the NFL is quote in bed with, with these sports books and then the players can't bet. The players are going to see a huge, huge mm-hmm. markup from this. Not, not as much as they should. I, as I talked about last week on the show, I'm very pro labor. I think they should get more as a percentage of what. But this money that's coming into the NFL will raise every boat, including the players. 
And so the players are partaking in gambling. And in fact, they're, they're benefiting from it very, they're going to benefit, benefit from it immensely through stadium deals. and All these things that, that make the league more popular, the players are going to see that money. And so I don't have a problem with the league getting in bed with gambling. I think it makes it, you know, more, uh, you know, makes the league more popular and all this stuff. I, I love, you know, some of these sub leagues like, you know, XFL, USFL getting into it as well, because again, it grows the game. We just have to be honest. You know, we have to be, you know, we, I think we just have to do a better job of messaging. And I, I think that the stuff that Florio is doing on Pro Football Talk, where he's like, you know, everything he like, we just, and we need a more educated betting populace. I mean, all of us, you know, have had various stages of being clueless and these sharp betters on the internet will tell us how big of idiots we are, but they're right. I mean, like in a lot of ways, everything Florio talks about when it comes to betting, for example, is through the lens of somebody you know has never bet. And so no, you know, knows, you know, none of the intricacies of how it actually works. And I think like we do need to, if we're going to see this league get more in bed with gambling, we have to have people who are experts in actually gambling talking about kind of how it goes. Because this idea that the NFL is somehow morally onerous for encouraging gaming while not letting their players bet on their own games, that, that's an ignorant statement. You do not want players betting on their own games. That's bad. Um, but you and this idea that they're not benefiting from it is also wrong. And so we just need to educate people better. We need to stop having scare tactics. And, you know, I, I think gambling is, you know, it can be good as long as, you know, we do a good job of, of regulating and, and restricting it. And, and that's basically what we've been doing. The reason we're getting so many cases is because we've regulated the industry. And now we're, you know, the, the it is like the product, uh, you know, sort of of regulation. Um, as we as we close up here, Tage, let's take a few questions from the listeners. Uh, if you have questions, go ahead and 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 throw them, uh, you know, sort of in the in the chat. We did talk, um, you know, we did talk a little bit, and I do want to finish off with the running back conversation. Last week, Tage, I talked about if you want to make running backs have better, you know, compensation in the NFL, you need to do away with the rookie wage scale, mm-hmm. and you may need to do away with the draft altogether. To me, that's like the only way I think to do it because if you change the rookie wage scale for different positions, teams are just going to draft differently, right? And so you're just going to see running backs never drafted high. That's just going to be how it goes. So I don't think that's enough. I think that abolishing the draft is never going to happen. And and I think all of us selfishly love the event. So, you know, we're talking on both sides of our mouth, but the, but that to me is the only way I think that you can give different, like you're going to get a situation where running backs are going to get their due. Yes. No, I, I, I'm with you. And, you know, just to, to throw some data out there, uh, you know, Brad, Brad Spielberger wrote a really good article yesterday about running backs and um, Texans cap uh, who, who does really good work responded with, with the graph he was looking at. So from 2011 to 2023, if you look at position contract a- a- APY growth, how much they're making per year, the salary cap has grown 87% in, in these last 12 years, which is, which is really good for the league. Quarterback contracts have grown 189%. Um, tight end contracts have grown 130%. And, and, you know, you can go down the list and see really big jumps for almost every position in the league. Running back contracts have only grown 13% in this time, while the, you know, the, the salary cap has gone up 87%. So running back contracts are really – lacking behind right now and this is the the second contract nature of the things and that's the the really tough part for these running backs is for most positions when you get to your second contract is when you start the peak of your career like the the peak of most players careers in most positions start around 25 26 years old and and we see these players really excel at those ages for running backs because of the wear and tear and the functionality of the position their peaks are around 22 23 years old and so that's at the start of their rookie contract. And that's why I agree with you on the rookie wage scale, abolishing that and having players decide what their market value is when they come out of college, instead of that being decided for them based on their draft slot is the right way to go here. Because now these running backs that are going to provide a decent amount of value their first four years are going to get fairly compensated for those first four years, even though those next four years after their, their initial contract is done, won't be as high as other positions. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the draft kind of is the only means that you can push them down and say, well, still, you're still not that valuable because we only took at 50. Right. But if 
they all sort of held out, it would probably help, right? If we didn't have a draft and you had to, you know, pick up running backs, I think that you would start to see the market equilibrate a little bit. I think keeping the draft in place, but abolishing the rookie wage scale would help, especially for like these truly elite running backs, like, like mm-hmm. Bijan Robinson and Saquon Barkley, that they would get theirs early. Right. Um, but later on, um, I think that teams would just kind of get around it. I mean, these teams, they're slow to it, but they adapt to what's optimal, generally speaking, over a long haul. So that that's an important uh, you know thing to think about. I, like I said, I'm pro labor. I loved, you know, the, the, the hardest part, and this is where I think people misunderstand analytics a lot. It's like guys like you and me, like we want to see these players get paid. We also want to see these teams win. And, and as long as there is a competition to football, we are always going to eschew the art and the and the the thing that we love. Like I I, I think about and, and these are really really smart football people. And I think about somebody like Nate Tice and I think about kind of how he views the game or somebody you know uh, I, I used to work with at PFF Seth Galina or Gante Ali and they're like they see the game maybe more artistically and sort of there's like a a beauty to it right. And that was why the perfectly blocked runs article made so much sense because it's like when a run is perfectly blocked, it's no more beautiful. Like, there's no more beautiful play in football than when that happens, right? Yeah. And it, it happens to be efficient. It just doesn't happen very much. And so guys like you and me are like, well, I know it's beautiful, but it doesn't happen very much. And hence you're chasing after something that's not attainable. Whereas the football people are always going to be like, well, but it is beautiful and it's the way the game should be and all this kind of stuff. And so that's where the conflict is. I'd love to see the rules change so that paying a running back is part of an efficient strategy. That's what I'd love to see. And I think that that's where we can find common ground with people who want to see running backs pay more because we all are pro labor in that way. We just analytics people want to see the game such that the optimal strategy is one that gets everybody paid. And that that's a tough conflict because we don't have the power, of course, to change football, although we are changing football to an extent. I'm going to write an article this week about how people are going for more fourth downs and all this stuff. Like it, we, it is working. It's just slow. And, and progress is um, by its very nature slow. Um, speaking of something that's not slow, Tej, the growth of this podcast has been immense. We've seen, you know, month over month, 25%, 45%. We love the fact that you guys are coming and, wa- and listening to the show, watching on YouTube, especially, you know, with Thomas being out, we've got, we've got this, the, uh, give you guys the true stars of Sumer, Tej, Parker, people like that uh, have been hosting the show with such a plum. We are going to continue to give you guys you know, content. We're going to do more game preview stuff. We're going to do more game review. We might even have live game stuff for the fall. So just stay tuned here. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. Go to, to sumersports.com. Sign up for the newsletter. You're going to start to see the newsletter there fairly soon. You're going to start to see content uh, and, and data on that website really really soon as the season is approaching really fast so uh that that, i'm really excited for that stage yeah and you know let us know if we we've we've kind of thrown around the idea of uh you know drafting a best ball team while while doing one of these and and kind of showing people you know what our thought process would be uh given that we're about to get into july here and july is really the time to to draft best ball teams so if that's something that interests you let us know. And, and, you know, I'd, I'd really love all the comments that uh, people leave on the show and, and the reviews that people leave on, on Apple. I, you know, I'm, I'm an eager beaver myself, like one of the comments uh, said that, that they were, and, and that's why they listen to this show. So that's always really nice to see when, when uh, people are, are showing that they're enjoying listening to this. Yeah. It's, it's my, it's one of my favorite things to do. I know we pay our bills by doing data science. And uh, if, if no one, if, you know, the people that come to the content, that's a, uh, it, you know, it's, it is something that we pour our hearts and soul into, but there's also stuff we got to do during the day of coding and everything. And, uh, you know, you're just so top notch there. And it, it's a, it's really cool that we have Sumer have found people who are both technically amazing, but also really good on air and really good at talking about football. I do think that that will make us uh, incredibly valuable, uh, as, as an entity when people co- want to come and, 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 and see first in football intelligence, they'll, they'll come and see Sumer. So for Tay Seth. For Eric Eager, this has been episode 71 of the Super Sports Show. We'll see you on Monday uh, with myself and Thomas Dimitrov for episode 72.